Okay, thank you, Sue. Uh, <clears throat> we're going to talk this morning about seasonal forecasting and particularly calibration and combination of dynamical forecasts in ways that improve the forecast and in this context promote enhanced energy strategies. <clears throat> Our seasonal forecast, the World Climate Service, is a commercial enterprise. The, it, it is a cooperative endeavor between Prescient Weather, our company, and Meteo Group, which, as many of you know, is the uh, largest independent weather, weather organization in Europe. It has uh, subsidiaries in some six to eight countries, including Asia and the United States. So this is the, this is the front page. And uh, what we offer here are a, number of, uh, diff are a number of different products. The standard indexes are over here. This is the ENSO. These are uh, recent, uh, recent climate information. And if you come in, there are some free climate tools. Climate analysis tools is a set of uh, capabilities in which uh, meteorologists can do analog forecasts based on various indices. And then under forecast, we have the numerical forecast part. And when you go there, you find that you have the opportunity to select the ECMWF seasonal forecast, the National Weather Service climate forecast system, or the multi-model that we form from those two. For variables, you can select temperature, precip, or mean sea level pressure. You can predict, you can select a probability forecast, which is what is shown here, or the anomaly forecast and you can select the climatology period, whether you want 1982 to 2000 or 2000 to 2009. And what we display are the anomalies relative to the climatology. If you pick the climatology 1982 to 2009, you'll be horrified at how warm the anomalies are. So the topics are seasonal and subseasonal prediction, Skill of the World Climate Service Seasonal Forecast, Skill of the World Climate Service Subseasonal Forecast now in development. Subseasonal means intraseasonal or weeks two to four, two to six. And then we'll very briefly look at some applications of the forecast. I point out that much of our work in this now is supported by NOAA with a small business innovation research contract that is providing us the opportunity to do some very nice things we wouldn't otherwise be able to do. The goal of seasonal and subseasonal prediction is to provide users with reliable probabilities of deviations from average atmospheric and oceanic conditions in the weeks, months, or seasons ahead so that they can, take, so that they can manage risk and take advantage of opportunity. Well, I want to say a few words about the magnitude of the challenge. These are the distributions of the, sea, of the winter average temperature and the summer average temperature for Lincoln, Nebraska, a country is sort of in the center of the heartland of North America. And uh, I tried to get a companion for uh, France. I could find no record that extended to the present time that wasn't full of missing, uh, missing errors. So apparently the data is just not available to the rest of us in the world. The, uh, Point here in, in the point in looking at the binary forecast in which you're forecasting above or below, this here is the width of the distribution. In making that forecast, you're trying to predict the season will be in this half or it will be in this half. In the summer, the season will be in this half, it will be in this half. So that those are rather small tolerances. When you go to the trinary, ternary forecast or Below normal, near normal, above normal, obviously the, the areas decrease. And as you can see, predicting normal is difficult. It's easier to predict above normal or below normal than to predict normal because normal is so small. Now, so this was Lincoln. It is, it is uh, more universal than that. This is the width of the new near normal temperature tercile, the zonal average of the near normal temperature tercile as a function of latitude. And as you can see, in the summer hemisphere, that near normal average is out to about five degrees. When you get into the winter hemisphere, we get more action and we maybe get up to a degree and a half or two. 
Same thing uh, for here, the summer hemisphere here, and then the winter hemisphere, the winter in the southern hemisphere. So this is quite a challenge to be making reasonable statements about things happening in such small tolerances. We recently published a paper uh, on this topic that was a result of a seminar uh, sponsored by the uh, National Weather Service, and the uh, title is obviously somewhat similar to the title here. And the, the statement in that paper, the main conclusion of the article, is that properly calibrated probabilistic forecasts possess sufficient skill and reliability to contribute to effective decisions in government and business activities that are sensitive to intraseasonal and seasonal climate variability. Now, the way these forecasts are made, the ECMF does it differently than the, than the Weather Service. ECMWF starts 51 coupled forecasts at one time in the month. It uses one atmospheric state and it uses 51 ocean perturbations. The ocean perturbations are always the same so that you always know what happened in each, in, which, in each ensemble. So ensemble 45 is always generated by the same process, for example. Uh, NSF or NSEP, the CFS, National Weather Service, does it quite differently. It starts 16 coupled predictions each day and then runs them out. So those ensemble members are not identifiable. We start then with this collection, two collections of ensembles and try to find the best combination. In terms of uh, navigation on the site, you can select areas up here by clicking. You can get, you can get uh, North America, you can get Europe, you can get Africa, and so on. Uh, I went over this before. I'll say a word about anomaly forecast. One of the things we showed in the paper is that there's very little skill in the, anomaly, in the anomaly forecast, which is the average of all the ensemble members. Even after calibration, that, in, that average anomaly is, does very little better than climatology, whereas when you use the probability information, then you can do much better. Uh, Brian Peters did a very nice tutorial on uh, probabilities yesterday and made that very clear that we, we take advantage of this probability information. So then uh, you, can, you can pick the forecast period, you can pick the month, you can make all of these choices, and that's all available, and it will all come up for you on this website. Now, suppose then I have 15 ensemble members, 15 predictions. I would have a prediction of a temperature here, a temperature here, a temperature there, a temperature there. I sort those temperatures, so from small to large, and I assign each one a probability. And the way I assign a probability is if there's 15 of them, this has a probability of 1 over 16, 2 over 16, 3 over 16, 15 over 16. So now I have a probability distribution from my ensemble. And given that, I can start to think about whether the average is correct and whether the spread or the variance is correct. And that's maybe a little easier to think about in terms of probability densities rather than probability functions. The blue is the distribution from which the verification will be drawn. Now, how do I know the, ver the distribution from which the ver verification will be drawn? Well, we assume that things are steady and that the his history of that particular site in that particular time uh, <coughs> is statistically steady and so that the observed will represent that distribution. The distribution that we computed in the forecast is the red one. And so we have to do two things. We have to, first of all, move the average. This is called correcting the bias. And then second of all, we have to correct the variance. <coughs> the numerical forecasts are almost always underdispersed. They do not have large enough variance, and so they have to be, their variance has to be increased. Well, to do all of this, you need to have a considerable amount of information. In fact, you need about 20 or 30 years of, uh, of, of, of information about the, the seasonal characteristics you're trying to uh, forecast. So we start with a numerical prediction system. This is a model, like a general circulation model. The National Weather Service has one. ECMWF has one. You take all available, all available uh, 
observations for a 20 or 30 year period. You feed it into this numerical system in order to get a balanced picture and you create what's called a reanalysis. So now you have a digital climatology for 20 or 30 years with all sorts of imaginable uh, variables uh, <coughs> in great detail. You use those reanalyses as initial conditions to take your forecast system and run 20 or 30 years of forecasts. So now we know what this, we know how this system has performed over the last 20 or 30 years, and we can then start doing forecasts. And this is where you make the corrections. You find, for example, that this system in the summer is always too warm over the Indian subcontinent. Well, that is where you make that bias correction then, and you subtract out that warmth. So this, making this is a big endeavor. Uh, the problem of economics is they don't run it back long enough. They run it 20 years instead of 50 years. <clears throat> we come into this here, the government, the government or ECMWF produce the forecast. We run the calibration process. We produce forecasts that meet our customer requirements. And now, a word about how we try to calibrate these things. Uh, here I show a number of uh, predicted temperatures. This is a predicted temperature, a predicted temperature, a predicted temperature. But we don't assume that that's an exact value. We assume that it represents, uh, there's some uncertainty about it. So we represent this prediction with a uh, relatively narrow Gaussian distribution. And so this picture that you see here is called a Gaussian comb. And the idea now is to use the history to find out which of those ensemble members are doing, uh, are doing the best job of making the actual prediction. And so we go through a calibration process which is described mathematically up here. It's fairly complex. We provide, we, you would provide, find weights and a standard deviation and you get a new distribution then that looks like this. The problem for us is that <coughs> we have the order of 100 ensemble members and the order of 20 historical observations. So this would, I mean, you can run the, you can run the algorithm, but you will be uh, overfitting very seriously and your forecast will then be uh, uh, garbage at best. Uh, so what we're, we're not able to do that. What we do is we find one waiting for the, uh, CFS for the NWS, one waiting for ECMWF, and then this standard deviation. So we optimize the forecast by taking, taking uh, the better of the two models, giving the better of the two models a larger weight, and then adjusting the standard deviation. Having done that, we then have a probability distribution, which in principle we have this equation for. This is the Bayesian process. The iteration scheme is called the expect expectation maximum algorithm. <coughs> and what you're doing is you're assuming a priori, one, one ensemble member is best. And you go try to find that best ensemble member, and it turns out, well, you don't find the best ensemble member. You find one that is, one that is better and one that's about as good and so on and so on. But now we have this probability distribution for some point and some time, and we can, uh, compare the probability distribution to what we know from the climatology of the boundaries of normal. This is where below normal st starts. This is where above normal starts from the uh, climatology. And so we can read up here. This forecast is 50% probability of below normal. This one reads 18% probability of being above normal. The difference of those two is 32. So in this case, since 50, the probability of being below normal is 50%, we would make the forecast of being below normal. Obviously, you can have cases in which you get 34, 33, 33, and you would not be very confident in your forecast of below normal under those circumstances. Well, so as we've discussed here now, we use, we use the past information. Past errors are a prologue to future errors and can be used to improve the future forecast. So, so obviously then, this needs to be a sta statistically stationary process to calibrate the forecast. The way we go about this is to emulate the actual forecast process. We take 18 years of data, we calibrate the forecast from the, from the reforecast set, and we make, it, we make a forecast. 
We then we do another 18 years, we make a forecast. So we develop a set of forecasts on, based on this without going back and, and using the same data over uh, in the forecast. Now, there is, in the process of doing this, we create a climatology of observations in each one of these histories to make the cat correction. And what we will look at is the climatology of the data after the calibration, and we're going to find that there's a change from this climatology to the climatology of the periods in the forecast. The way we're going to look at the quality of the forecast is with contingency tables. And these, uh, these are a simple way to organize forecasts. A, the forecasts are in rows, the, the data in columns. A is the fraction of above normal forecasts that were correct. B is the fraction of above normal forecasts that were uh, wrong down here. D is the forecast of below normal forecasts that were correct, so on. We can look at the success ratio. What fraction of above normal forecasts did we detect? We can look at the fraction of forecasts correct. How many, uh, out of, how many of the forecasts for above normal were correct? So those are slightly different ways of looking at it. You can fiddle around with the statistics. And we're going to talk now about success ratios and fractions correct as, a, as the way of looking at the skill of forecast that is relevant to business applications. The same thing happens for ternary forecasts where you have above, uh, normal, and below. <clears throat> and we can do various summaries here. <clears throat> the if you go down the diagonals, then the, <clears throat> the perfect forecasts have a fraction correct and a, and a success ratio of one. Random forecasts would be one third. If it were random and ternary forecasts, then there would be one third of the forecast would, uh, one ninth of the forecast would be in each of the boxes. And so you go down the diagonal of correct forecasts, you add up to one third. So we can look at improvement ratios then, which are. <coughs> improvements over the random forecast or the random success ratios of one third. <clears throat> so this is a measure of the skill of the forecast that is useful in making business decisions. And let's imagine that we, uh, we have a uh, option going here. A, somebody's running a pool, so to speak, uh, and you can buy an option on the, uh, on the uh, climate being above normal, below normal, or normal for uh, P euros. And if your choice is correct, it pays three, it pays three euros. So this is a pot of money. People are making different, uh, different bets, so to speak, and we're assuming it's large enough that uh, this all works out. Well, for F, for F the fraction of correct forecast, you're going to get paid three FP. You'll get paid when it's correct. So you get paid three FP. You pay P for each one, and the fraction then the the, uh, the rate of return then is divided by P. You run through the algebra, and it ends up being this uh, improvement ratio over <coughs> random fraction correct minus a third divided by a third. So, when the fraction correct is uh, is one third, uh, the payoff is zero. By the time it's to 0.42, you're you're rate of return is 25%. At 50%, it's 50%. And if your fraction correct is 2 thirds, your payoff is 100. So this shows you that as your fractions correct become slightly better than the random, you're starting to make money with these forecasts. This is just a summary for uh, um, probability thresholds of 50% shows the same thing. And again, this is similarly global, uh, the column global, North America, Europe, tropical Pacific, the at the probability threshold of 50%, we're doing very nicely and making money. So that raises the question of how do these uh, fractions correct and success ratios change as you change the probability at which you act. And as you can see here, the fractions correct Increase as you say, I'm only going to act at 60% or 80%, you're going to have a very high fraction correct. Success ratio works the other way. If you want to catch events, 
you have to start with low probabilities. The problem here is that 60s and the 80s and the 90s don't occur very often. So it turns out that you'll make just as much money by operating in that pool, for example, starting at, say, every time the forecast is above 40%. <clears throat> now, here is a summary of profit ratio for seasonal forecasts. There's a lot of numbers here. You see immediately that there are some, you see immediately that there are problems with below and above. These are skewed. There are problems with Europe. We have a summary down here. If you add all this up, it doesn't look too bad that uh, we have fractions and correct and success ratios in the neighborhood of 30%. So this, this remembers profit. For fractions correct, this is the profit. <clears throat> so let's look at this issue now. The observations in the climatology of the forecast period have gone from one-third, one-third, one-third to 26%, 31%, 43%. Climate changed over that 18 year period in such a way that now we have far more above average observations than we did on the average during the training period. It's even worse with the forecast. And when you take the ratio then of the forecast to the OBS, you're seeing 76, 81, 128, 118, 157. So we've got a problem here in non stationarity in the forecast. <clears throat> We did try a trend adjustment with monthly forecasts. It is better. It's an improvement. It's not as good yet as we would like, but it, it probably is something that we're going to have to do in order to make these forecasts better. What's happening here is the modelers, both in the National Weather Service and at ECMWF, have said, well, the climate is warming. We will put in an increase in, of carbon dioxide in our model to try to correctly model the rate of climate change. So we have in the models an induced, induced warming. And that is compromising the quality of the forecast. The standard statistical advice is to separate long-term trends and short-term variations and treat them independently. So you could argue the modeler should be trying to run in a, st in a statistically steady state and let the users add the trends by adding trends to those forecasts. Now I'm going to say a couple of words about our uh, subseasonal forecast, two to, two to six weeks. The uh, customers are clamoring for these. And here is a first version. It is obviously similar to the seasonal forecast. This again, an anomaly forecast, probability forecast, the multi-model. We're doing the same thing with the two forecast systems. And this one uh, has a Google-like uh, presentation, so you can, do, you can do more interesting things. and, and uh, with the geography, and this is the forecast for uh, week two forecast for this week, and fortunately it's cool in France. This is something we think is kind of cute, the model DT. This is the, this is the forecast uh, lead four weeks, three weeks, two weeks, so you can see how the model is changing. You can see whether, it is, whether the model is becoming more confident about events or not. And I, I can't do it from this perspective here, but I think there's a warming that up here. Though certainly there's a warming in Scandinavia that it just barely appears here, becomes more pronounced in three, and now in week two is uh, <clears throat> more pronounced. So we're in the process of developing these. Uh, it's coming along. And this is a, this is a, a picture of the fractions correct for the week two forecast. And, uh, in July and June and August, and if you look at the scale here, you can see that any time we're in green, then the fractions of correct are doing very well. So these forecasts are <coughs> uh, appearing so far to be very good, and this is a relatively limited history. It's a very intensive computation for these, much more so than the monthly and the seasonal. So. <coughs> 
This is what the numbers look like for the four-week forecast for profit ratios. Those are very nice-looking numbers. There's only two minuses in here. There's only two minuses in here. Again, uh, in your uh, below in normal, indicating that we we still haven't solved that problem. Here is the overall average profit ratios for the World Climate Service forecast, and they're pretty good. Uh, it shows, as I is in the in the uh, summary that I quoted for you, you can make money with these forecasts. And the comparison here between the monthly forecasts in the original mode, the monthly forecast with trend adjustments shows that we're getting profit ratios that increase on the order of 10 units, uh, 7 units, and so on. So that the first, our first try at trend adjustment has been relatively successful. Now, if you concatenate the mission statements of utilities around the world, uh, the, you will find that the, the, uh, the, the common terms in the mission of the energy industry are provide energy reliably, efficiently, safely, economically, with an appropriate return to investors and owners. <clears throat> well, weather and climate have both favorable and adverse uh, impacts on each component of this mission. So a quantitative description of the skill of the forecast, stated as I did in ratios critical to business, allows them to be used effectively in assessing the probability of mission success through use of appropriate alternatives and strategies. The point here is not that you know that any given forecast is going to be correct, but that you know if over a period of years and a number of various cases uh, you use the forecast, you can predict what the consequences of committing to that algorithm might be. <clears throat> at at uh, ICAM 20, 000, 2011, on the Gold Coast, uh, one of my summary slides was the grand challenges of atmospheric informatics relative to energy, and certainly identify and understand the key decisions in energy and, and other industries on the full range of temporal and spatial scales, create effective processes for transferring information, collaborate in the design and implementation of decision systems. And exactly with these probabilistic forecasts, how the users are going to use them, how we're going to go about translating what the international forecast centers produce for us into things that are very useful to our customers and to the energy world is what this slide is describing. And the discussion that we've been having to some degree over who's responsible for what, I, I make the argument that these interactions with the customer and helping the customer design their decision systems are something that essentially has to happen in the private sector. <clears throat> the profit ratios allow energy industries to improve their trading results by knowing the fractions of correct forecasts expected at each predicted probability level. It allows them to improve hedging of adverse conditions by using success ratios because they can assess the long-term net returns, the variance, and the cost at various probabilities of adverse events. And that is using this diagram that we already looked at. So in conclusion, the extensive, and I'll say rigorous, verification studies of the World Climate Service multi-model ensemble forecasts provide a quantitative description of skill and value that promotes confidence in long-term results using strategies based on the forecasts and encourages development of a hedge on forecast strategy by providing a statistical foundation for judging cost and the probability of success. Well, we've started to look at hedge on forecast, and uh, unfortunately it's too complex and too immature to show here, but uh, maybe, maybe we will have that uh, for 2015 if we have another ICAM. Um, well, certainly thanks for your interest. We'd be glad to have any of you take a look at the site. If you contact me, I'll give you a card with, some, uh, with the logon credentials for the ICAM demonstration. I think, the, I think the demonstration is good until the 31st of July. Uh, if you don't contact me or I run out of cards, it's very simple. Go to the World Climate Service site. All you have to do is remember World Climate Service. Google that. You'll get the World Climate Service homepage that I showed you. Upper right-hand corner has contacts. Click on that, and you will see an info 
statement, info at prescientweather.com. Send us a message and say you're at the ICAM meeting and you would like to have a ICAM demo account and the wheels will whir and you will get a demo account. So, thank you very much. Thank you, John. Do we have any questions for John? Great. Hello, John. Uh, my name is Dan Gerton. I'm from uh, EDF Trading uh, based out of London. I was wondering if in your uh, sub-seasonal forecast, let's say two to four weeks or two to six weeks, if you factor in such variables as the MJO or any stratospheric dynamics, or, or are those already accounted for in the EC weeklies and the CFS forecasts? They are presumably accounted for in the dynamical uh, forecast. Uh, obviously, the, the numerical systems attempt to uh, work with those things. Now, we're aware that uh, there are people in the world that would like to see a explicit uh, representation of what MJO is doing, what QBO is doing, and so on and so on. And that, that will be uh, added, global wind, the global wind, whatever it is, those uh, will be added in phases uh, two and three. This development is going to be a three-phase uh, process, and uh, the, the first phase is the temperature forecast. Obviously, we have to do wind and precipita or precipitation. We will be doing wind. Uh, I think maybe we're going to start, we will start thinking about solar, obviously, as a result of the interest that we've seen at this conference. So the subseasonal is beta at best at this point, but it's uh, coming along, and we know that, uh, we know that a lot of people want to see it. We're surprised at how good they have been because the, the, common, the common knowledge was that uh, this period between the, the, the one to ten days and the seasonal forecast is, quote, impossible. It's turning out to be pretty good. I just want to um, ask a, a bit, sort of backtracking a little bit. Um, so you're combining two models together in these forecasts. I just wanted to ask, have you got any, can you share any views on the relative merits of having multiple models versus having more ensemble members for a better calibration? And perhaps just to kind of explain where I'm coming from this, on the, you get, showed a forecast plot of um, the forecast correctness at week two, it was in, colored in green. Um, and it had quite a diffuse structure over the North Atlantic sector. Now, we've been looking at the ECMWF subseasonal forecast um, in that sector, and there's quite a distinct tripole pattern in that region, which makes us think that it's connected to the jet position. Now, each model will have its own climatological jet position, so in some sense, by combining models, you're potentially smearing them out. So in climate model world, combining across models is usually a good thing, but I, I wonder, can you comment on if there's differences in this sub-seasonal to seasonal times go, where the multi-model versus more members of a single model might be a, a different problem? Well, I think as, as, as you know as well as I do, David, the, the, uh, the origin of this was with Tim Palmer at ECMWF starting to combine models from different forecast centers and finding that the, uh, the multi-models were, uh, were, were more reliable and did a better job than any individual model. Now. Uh, that's what we're seeing. Uh, we, have, we have what turned out to be two pretty good models. The, the CFS and ECMWF are quite competitive these days. And when we, compare, when we compare how they behave here and there, CFS, curious, CFS is better in Europe <laughs> on some things. CFS is better on precipitation in, in some places. The working the two of them together seems to be a very successful combination. We have looked at the national National Multi-Model Ensemble in the United States, which is another five or six uh, models. First look there, those models don't help us in adding them in. We're better off sticking with CFS and with uh, ECMWF. So you certainly could take a collection of crummy models and make a model that was worse. <laughs> but it seems to be that if you start with good models, then, then the combination is better. And, and we, after all, we're, we're, take, we're taking account of this fact that CFS is better here in summer, ECMF is better here in winter, and we're taking advantage of that in our multi-model. 
Okay, I think we're going to have to move on now. Thank you, John, and let's thank John again here.